Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Ludwig Tieck, The Friends. It was a beautiful spring morning when Louis Wandell went out to visit a sick friend in a village some miles distance from his dwelling. This friend had written to him to say that he was lying dangerously ill and would gladly see him and speak to him once more. The cheerful sunshine now sparkled in the bright green bushes. The birds twittered and leapt to and fro on the branches. The lark sang merrily above the thin, fleeting clouds. Sweet scents rose from the fresh meadows, and the fruit trees of the garden were white and gay in blossom. Louis's eye roamed intoxicate around him. His soul seemed to expand, but he thought of his invalid friend, and he bent forward in silent dejection. Nature had decked herself all in vain, so serenely and so brightly, his fancy could only picture to him the sick bed and his suffering brother. How song is sounding from every bough, cried he. The notes of the birds mingle in sweet unison with the whisper of the leaves, and yet in the distance, through all the charm of the concert, come the sighs of the sick one. Whilst he thus communed, a troop of gaily clad peasant girls issued from the village. They all gave him a friendly salutation, and told him that they were on their merry way to a wedding, that work was over for the day, and had to give place to festivity. He listened to their tale, and still their merriment rang in the distance on his ear. Still he caught the sound of their songs, and became more and more sorrowful. In the wood he took his seat on a dismantled tree, drew the off-red letter from his pocket, and ran through it once more. "'My very dear friend, I cannot tell why you have so utterly forgotten me, that I received no news from you. I am not surprised that men forsake me.' but it heartily pains me to think that you, too, care nothing about me. I am dangerously ill. A fever saps my strength. If you delay visiting me any longer, I cannot promise you that you will see me again. All nature revives and feels fresh and strong. I alone sink lower in languor. The returning warmth cannot animate me. I see not the green fields, nothing but the tree that rustles before my window, and sings death songs to my thoughts. My bosom is pent, my breathing is hard, and often I think the walls of my room will press closer together and crush me. The rest of you in the world are holding the most beautiful festival of life, whilst I must languish in the dwelling of sickness. Gladly would I dispense with spring, if I could but see your dear face once more. But you that are in health, never earnestly think of what it really is to be ill, and how dear to us, then, in our helplessness, the visit of a friend is. You do not know how to prize those precious minutes of consolation, because the whole world receives you in the warmth and fervor of its friendship. Ah, if you did but know, as I do, how terrible is death, and how still more terrible it is to be ill, oh, Louis, how would you hasten, then, to behold once more this frail form, that you have hitherto called your friend, and that by and by will be so ruthlessly dismembered. If I were well, I would haste to meet you, or fancy that you may perhaps be ill at this moment. If I never see you again, farewell. What a painful impression did the suffering depicted in this letter make upon Lewis's heart, amid the liveliness of nature, as she lay in brilliancy before him. He melted into tears and rested his head on his hand. Carol now, you foresters, thought he, for you know no lamentation. Ye lead a buoyant, poetic existence, and for this are those swift pinions granted you. Oh, how happy are you, that you need not mourn. Warm summer calls you, and you wish for nothing more. You dance forth to meet it, and when winter is advancing, you are gone. Oh, light-winged merry forest life, how do I envy thee? Why are there so many heavy cares burdened upon poor man's heart? Why may he not love without purchasing his love by wailing, his happiness by misery? Life pearls on like a fleeting rivulet beneath his feet, and quenches not his thirst, his fervid longing. He became more and more absorbed in thought, and at last he rose and pursued his way through the thick forest. If I could but help him, cried he, if nature could but supply me with a means of saving him, but as it is, I feel nothing but my own impotency and the pain of losing my friend. 
In my childhood, I used to believe in enchantment and all its supernatural aids. What I now could hope in them as happily as then. He quickened his steps, and involuntarily, all the remembrances of the earliest years of his childhood crowded back upon him. He followed those forms of loveliness, and was soon entangled in such a labyrinth as not to notice the objects that surrounded him. He had forgotten that it was spring, that his friend was ill. He hearkened to the wondrous melodies which came borne, as if from distant shores, upon his ear. All that was most strange united itself to what was most ordinary. His whole soul was transmuted. From the far vista of memory, from the abyss of the past, all those forms were summoned forth that had ever enraptured or tormented him. All those dubious phantoms were aroused that flutter formlessly about us and gather in dizzy hum around our heads. Puppets, the toys of childhood, and specters danced along before him and so mantled over the green turf that he could not see a single flower at his feet. First love encircled him with its twilight morning gleam and let down its sparkling rainbow over the mead. His earliest sorrows glided past him in review, and threatened to greet him in the same guise at the end of his pilgrimage. Lewis sought to arrest all these changeful feelings, and to retain a consciousness of self amid the magic of enjoyment, but in vain. Like enigmatic books, with figures grotesquely gay, that open for a moment, and in a moment are closed, so unstably and fleetingly all floated before his soul. The wood opened, and in the open country on one side lay some old ruins, encompassed with watch-towers and ramparts. Lewis was astonished at having advanced so quickly amid his dreams. He emerged from his melancholy, as he did from the shades of the wood, for often the pictures within us are but the reflection of outward objects. Now rose on him, like the morning sun, the memory of his first poetical enjoyments, of his earliest appreciations of that luscious harmony which many a human ear never inhales. How incomprehensibly, said he, did those things commingle then, which seemed to me eternally parted by such vast chasms. My most undefined presentments assumed a form and outline, and gleamed on me in the shape of a thousand subordinate phantoms, which till then I had never descried. So names were found me for things that I had long wished to speak of. I became recipient of earth's fairest treasures, which my yearning heart had so long sought for in vain. And how much have I to thank for thee since then, divine power of fancy and poetry? How hast thou smoothed for me the path of life that erst appeared so rough and perplexed? Ever hast thou revealed to me new sources of enjoyment and happiness, so that no arid desert presents itself to me now? Every stream of sweet, voluptuous inspiration hath wound its way through my earth-born heart. I have become intoxicate with bliss, and have communed with the beings of heaven. The sun sank below the horizon, and Lewis was astonished that it was already evening. He was insensible of fatigue, and was still far from the point which he had wished to reach before night. He stood still, without being able to understand how the crimson of evening could be so early mantling the clouds, how the shadows of everything were so long, while the nightingale warbled her song of wail in the thicket. He looked round him. The old ruins lay far in the background, clad in blushing splendor, and he doubted whether he had not strayed from the direct and well-known road. Now he remembered a fantasy of his early childhood that till that moment had never recurred to him. It was a female form of awe that glided before him over the lonely fields. She never looked round, yet he was compelled, against his will, to follow her, and to be drawn on into unknown scenes, without in the least being able to extricate himself from her power. A slight thrill of fear came over him, and yet he found it impossible to obtain a more distinct recollection of that figure, or to usher back his mind into the frame, in which this image had first appeared to him. He sought to individualize all these singular sensations when, looking round by chance, he really found himself on a spot which, often as he had been that way, he had never seen before. "'Am I spellbound?' cried he. "'Or have my dreams and fancies crazed me? Is it the wonderful effect of solitude that makes me unrecognizable to myself, or do spirits and genii hover around me and hold my senses in thrall? 
Sooth, if I cannot enfranchise myself from myself, I will await that woman phantom that floated before me in every lonely place in my childhood. He endeavored to rid himself of every kind of fantasy in order to get to the right road again, but his recollections became more and more perplexed. The flowers at his feet grew larger, the red glow of evening more brilliant, and wondrously shaped clouds hung drooping on the earth like the curtains of some mystic scene that was soon to unfold itself. A ringing murmur arose from the high grass, and the blades bowed to one another, as if in friendly converse, while a light warm spring rain dropped pattering amongst them, as if to wake every slumbering harmony in the wood and bush and flower. Now all was rife with song and sound, a thousand sweet voices held promiscuous parley. Song entwined itself in song, and tone in tone, while in the waning crimson of eve lay countless blue butterflies rocking, with his radiance sparkling from their wavy wings. Lewis fancied himself in a dream, when the heavy dark red clouds suddenly rose again, and a vast prospect opened on him in unfathomable distance. In the sunshine lay a gorgeous plain, sparkling with verdant forests and dewy underwood. In its center glittered a palace of myriad hues, as if composed of all undulating rainbows and gold and jewels. A passing stream reflected its various brilliancy, and a soft crimson ether environed this hall of enchantment. Strange birds, he had never seen before, flew about, sportively flapping each other with their red and green wings. Larger nightingales warbled the clear notes in the echoing landscape. Lambent flames shot through green grass, flickering here and there, and then darting in coils round the mansion. Lewis drew nearer and heard ravishing voices sing the following words. Traveler from earth below, wend thee not farther. In our hall's magic glow, bide with us rather. Hast thou with longing scanned joy's distant morrow, cast away sorrow, and enter the wished-for land. Without further scruple, Lewis stepped to the shining threshold, and lingering but a moment ere he set his foot on the polished stone, he entered. The gates closed after him. Hitherward, hitherward, cried invisible lips, as from the inmost recesses of the palace, and with loudly throbbing heart he followed the voices. All his cares, all his olden remembrances were cast away, his inmost bosom rang with the songs that outwardly encompassed him. His every regret was stilled. His every conscious and unconscious wish was satisfied. The summoning voices grew so loud that the whole building re-echoed them, and still he could not find their origin, though he long seemed to have been standing in the central hall of the palace. At length a ruddy-cheeked boy stepped up to him and saluted the stranger guest. He led him through magnificent chambers, full of splendor and melody, and at last entered the garden where Lewis, as he said, was expected. Entranced he followed his guide, and the most delicious fragrance from a thousand flowers floated forth to meet him. Broad shady walks received them. Lewis's dizzy gaze could scarcely gain the tops of the high immemorial trees. Bright-colored birds sat perched upon the branches. Children were playing on guitars in the shade, and they and the birds sang to the music. Fountains shot up, with the clear red of morning sparkling upon them. The flowers were high as shrubs, and parted spontaneously as the wanderer pressed through them. He had never before felt the hallowed sensations that then enkindled in him. Never had such pure heavenly enjoyment been revealed to him. He was over-happy. But bells of silver sound rang through the trees, and their tops were bowed, the birds and children with the guitars were hushed. The rosebuds unfolded, and the boy now conducted the stranger into the midst of a brilliant assembly. Lovely dames of lofty form were seated on beautiful hanks of turf in earnest conference. They were above the usual height of the human race, and their more than earthly beauty had at the same time something of awe in it, from which the heart shrunk back in alarm. Lewis dared not interrupt their conversation. It seemed as if he were among the godlike forms of Homer's song, where every thought must be excluded that formed the converse of mortals. Odd little spirits stood round, as ready ministers, 
waiting attentively for the wink of the moment that should summon them for the posture of quietude. They fixed their glances on the stranger, and then looked jeeringly and significantly at each other. At last the beautiful women ceased speaking, and beckoned Lewis to approach. He was still standing with an embarrassed air, and drew near to them with trembling. "'Be not alarmed,' said the fairest of them all. "'You are welcome to us here, and we have long been expecting you. Long have you wished to be in our abode. Are you satisfied now?' "'Oh, how unspeakably happy I am!' exclaimed Lewis. "'All my dearest dreams have met with their fulfillment. All my most daring wishes are gratified now. Yes, I am. I live among them. How has it happened so? I cannot comprehend.' sufficient for me that it is so. Why should I raise a new wall over this enigma, ere my olden lamentations are scarcely at an end? Is this life, asked the lady, very different from your former one? My former life, said Lewis, I can scarcely remember. But has, then, this golden state of existence fallen to my lot, this beautiful state, after which my every sense and prescience so ardently expired? to which every wish wandered, that I could conceive in fancy, or realized in my inmost thought. Though its image, veiled in mist, seemed ever strange to me, and is it, then, mine at last? Have I, then, achieved this new existence? And does it hold me in its embrace? Oh, pardon me, I know not what I say in my delirium of ecstasy, and might well weigh my words more carefully in such an assemblage. The lady signed, and in a moment every minister was in motion. There was a stirring among the trees, everywhere running to and fro, and speedily a banquet was placed before Louis of fair fruits and fragrant wines. He sat down again, and the music rose anew on the air. Rows of beautiful boys and girls sped round him, intertwined in the dance, while uncouth little kobolds lent life to the scene and excited loud laughter by their ludicrous gambols. Lewis noted every sound and every gesture. He seemed newly born since his initiation into this joyous existence. Why, thought he, are those hopes and reveries of ours so often laughed at, that pass into fulfillment sooner than ever had been expected? Where, then, is that border mark between truth and error, which mortals are ever ready with such temerity to set up? Oh, I ought in my former life to have wandered oftener from the way, and then perhaps I should have ripened all the earlier for this happy transmutation. The dance died away. The sun sank to rest. The august dames arose. Louis too left his seat and accompanied them on their walk through the quiet garden. The nightingales were complaining in a softened tone, and a wondrous moon rose above the horizon. The blossoms opened to its silver radiance, and every leaf kindled in its gleam. The wide avenues became of a glow, casting shadows of a singular green. Red clouds slumbered on the green grass of the fields. The fountains turned to gold and played high in the clear air of heaven. Now you will wish to sleep, said the loveliest of the ladies, and showed the enraptured wanderer a shadowy bower, strewn with soft turf and yielding cushions. Then they left him, and he was alone. He sat down and watched the magic twilight glimmering through the thickly woven foliage. How strange this is, said he to himself. Perhaps I am now only asleep, and I may dream that I am sleeping a second time, and may have a dream in my dream. And so it may go on forever, and no human power ever able to wake me. No, unbeliever that I am. It is a beautiful reality that animates me now, and my former state, perhaps, was but the dream of gloom. He lay down, and light breezes played round him. Perfume was wafted on the air, and little birds sang lulling songs. In his dreams he fancied the garden all around him changed. The tall trees withered away, the golden moon fallen from the sky, leaving a dismal gap behind her. Instead of the watery jet from the fountains, little genii rushed out, caracoling over each other in the air, and assuming the strangest attitudes. Notes of woe supplanted the sweetness of song, and every trace of that happy abode had vanished. Lewis awoke amid impressions of fear, 
and chided himself for still feeding his fancy in the perverse manner of the habitants of earth, who mingle all received images in rude disorder, and present them again in this garb in a dream. A lovely morning broke over the scene, and the lady saluted him again. He spoke to them more intrepidly, and was today more inclined to cheerfulness, as the surrounding world had less power to astonish him. He contemplated the garden and the palace, and fed upon the magnificence and the wonders that he met there. Thus he lived many days happily, in the belief that his felicity was incapable of increase. But sometimes the crowing of a cock seemed to sound in the vicinity, and then the whole edifice would tremble, and his companions turn pale. This generally happened of an evening, and soon afterwards they retired to rest. Then often there would come a thought of earth into Lewis's soul. Then he would often lean out the windows of the glittering palace to arrest and fix these fleeting remembrances, and to get a glimpse of the high road again, which, as he thought, must pass that way. In this sort of a mood, he was one afternoon alone, musing within himself, why it was just as impossible for him then to recall a distinct remembrance of the world as formerly it had been to feel a presage of this poetic place of sojourn when all at once a post-horn seemed to sound in the distance and the rattle of carriage wheels to make themselves heard how strangely said he to himself does a faint gleam a slight reminiscence of earth break upon my delight rendering me melancholy and dejected then do I lack anything here? Is my happiness still incomplete? The beautiful women returned. What do you wish for? said they, in a tone of concern. You seem sad. You will laugh, replied Lewis. Yet grant me one favor more. In that other life I had a friend, who I now but faintly remember. He is ill, I think. Restore him by your skill. Your wish is already gratified, said they. But, said Lewis, vouchsafe me two questions. Speak. Does no gleam of love fall on this wondrous world? Does no friendship perambulate these bowers? I thought the morning blush of spring love would be eternal here, which in that other life is too prone to be extinguished, and which men afterwards speak of as a fable. To confess you the truth, I feel an unspeakable yearning after those sensations. Then you long for earth again. Oh, never, cried Lewis, for in that cold earth I used to sigh for friendship and for love, and they came not near me. The longing of those feelings had to supply the place of those feelings themselves, and for that reason I turned my aspirations hitherward, and hoped here to find everything in the most beautiful harmony. Fool, said the venerable woman, so on earth you sighed for earth, and knew not what you did in wishing to be here. You have overshot your desires, and substituted fantasies, for the sensations of mortals. Then who are you? cried Lewis, astounded. We are the old fairies, said she, of whom you surely must have heard long ago. If you ardently long for earth, you will return thither again. Our kingdom flourishes when mortals are shrouded in night, but their day is our night. Our sway is of ancient date, and will long endure. It abides invisibly among men, to your eye alone has it been revealed. She turned away, and Lewis remembered that it was the same form which had resistlessly dragged him after it in his youth, and of which he had felt a secret dread. He followed now also, crying, No, I will not go back to earth, I will stay here. So then, said he to himself, I divined this lofty being even in my childhood, and so the solution of many a riddle, which we are too idle to investigate, may be within ourselves. He went on much further than usual, till the fairy garden was soon left far behind him. He stood on a romantic mountain range, where the ivy clambered in wild tresses up the rocks, cliff was piled on cliff, and awe and grandeur seemed to hold universal sway. Then there came a wandering stranger to him, who accosted him kindly, and addressed him thus. Glad I am, after all, to see you again. I know you not, said Lewis. That may well be, replied the other, but once you thought you knew me well. I am your late sick friend. Impossible. You are quite a stranger to me. Only, said the stranger, because today you see me for the first time in my true form. Till now you only found me in a reflection of yourself. 
You are right, too, in remaining here, for there is no love, no friendship, not here, I mean, where all illusion vanishes. Lewis sat down and wept. What ails you? said the stranger. That it is you, you who are the friend of my youth. Is not that mournful enough? Well, come back with me to our dear, dear earth, where we shall know each other once more under elusive forms, where there exists a superstition of friendship. What am I doing here? What will that avail? answered the stranger. You will want to be back again. Earth is not bright enough for you. The flowers are too small for you, the song too suppressed. Color there cannot emerge so brilliantly from the shade. Flowers there are of small comfort, and so prone to fade. The little birds think of their death, and sing in modest constraint. But here everything is on a scale of grandeur. Oh, I will be contented, cried Lewis, as the tears gushed profusely from his eyes. Do but come back with me and be my friend once more. Let us leave this desert, this glittering misery. Thus saying, he opened his eyes, for someone was shaking him roughly. Over him leant the friendly but pale face of his once sick friend. But are you dead? cried Lewis. Recovered am I, wicked sleeper, he replied. Is it thus you visit your sick friend? Come along with me. My carriage is waiting there, and a thunderstorm is rising. Lewis rose. In his sleep he had glided off the trunk of the tree. His friend's letter lay open beside him. So am I really on the earth again, he exclaimed with joy. Really? And this is no new dream. You will not escape from earth, answered his friend with a smile, and both were locked in heartfelt embraces. How happy I am, said Lewis, that I have you once more, that I feel as I used to do, and that you are well again. Suddenly, replied his friend, I felt ill, and as suddenly I was well again. So I wished to go to you, and to do away with the alarm that my letter must have caused you, and here, halfway, I find you asleep. I do not deserve your love at all, said Lewis. Why? Because I just now doubted of your friendship. But only in sleep. It will be strange enough, though, said Lewis, if there really were such things as fairies. There are such of a certainty, replied the other, but it is all a fable, and their whole pleasure is to make men happy. They plant those wishes in our bosoms, which we ourselves do not know of, those overwrought pretensions, that superhuman covetousness of superhuman gifts, so that in our desponding delirium we afterwards despise the beautiful earth with all its glorious stores. Lewis answered with a pressure of the hand. The End